So welcome back from a brief break. And we hope that we will continue staying on this theme, one garden, one property, one village, town, city, region, state at a time. And to this afternoon, we're going to continue with talks like Carrie's in the morning, where we're highlighting our active PRISM partners. So um, we have seven of them. And the, how the flow of the afternoon is going to go is each of them is going to give a short talk. And then we'll allow some Q&A for each of the speakers. And then we'll just go through all of the speakers and conclude by 3.30. Uh, so our first speaker is Chris McArdle. And he is with the New York Restoration Project here in New York City. He is an avid outdoor enthusiast, a world traveler, tree lover, dog dad, and he started with NYRP through the AmeriCorps program, which is an, an exceptional opportunity for young students to engage in active work in our city uh, and also throughout America. Um, and so uh, he has been working there for about, uh, he, he started there in 2015 at uh, NYRP through the AmeriCorps program. Um, so let's hear about urban forestry for the community. Chris McArdle. Good afternoon, my name is Chris. I'm the natural area supervisor of the northern half of Highbridge Park. Uh, for the New York Restoration Project. Harbridge Park is located on the western bank of the Harlem River in Washington Heights. It stretches between 155th Street and Dykeman Street in northern Manhattan. Over the years, Highbridge has seen many dramatic land changes. During the Revolutionary War, British troops cleared the forest and built the roads. In the early 1900s, an amusement park was built and soon thereafter burnt to the ground, taking large chunks of the forest with it. In the following decades, sec sections of the forest were cleared and used as farmlands. Hundreds of abandoned automobiles and tons of trash found their ways into the forest. And most recently, in the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy, hundreds of trees were felled. In collaboration with the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation, New York Restoration Project has been making drastic reforestation efforts in order to restore the land of Highbridge back to its native origins. On any given day in Highbridge, you may encounter many beautiful native species. Red-tailed hawks, the northern dusky salamanders. Um, Highbridge is actually the only location that they are found in Manhattan. Um, rock formations made from Manhattan schist. Eastern skunk cabbage. Highbridge has come a long way over the past few decades, but it's still home to vast amount of vinelands and invasive species, which has been detrimental to the native landscape. These invasive species can, can fundamentally alter the structure, composition, and dynamics of plant communities. Uh, they can form monocultures that tend to support a lower diversity of animal species, uh, and long-term invasion can alter ecosystem properties. Converting forest monocultures to multi-species forests will generally result in a higher delivery of ecosystem goods and services to humans and wildlife. Urban ecological restoration requires, re requires long-term time and commitment. Enhancing forest regeneration requires patience and institutional memory, both essential to learning from past management effort. Over time, MYRP has made progress converting vineland to forest through low impact community-driven invasive management, concurrent with the in, uh, introduction of native species. Our primary partner is the New York City Parks Department of Recreation. However, we work closely with local community stakeholders, schools, and environmental groups. In a study conducted over the span of 15 to 20 years in three major New York City parks, Leah Johnson concluded that invasive species removal followed by native tree planting resulted in persistent structural and compositional shifts significantly lower invasive species abundance, more complex forest structure, and greater native tree recruitment. Biodiversity is a major driving force in ecosystem function and a major factor in NYRP's efforts in hybrids. Over the years, NYRP has planted thousands of trees and shrubs, ranging over dozens of native species, 
which has contributed to the reintroduction of native wildlife, including a variety of birds, squirrels, possums, raccoons, butterflies, and groundhogs, to name a few. Not only has MIRP's efforts positively impacted the forest, but the neighboring community members have also benefited. The return of a healthy forest has led to an increase in human visitors to the park. It is now common to see joggers, picnickers, and dog walkers enjoying the once empty cliffside paths, taking in the dramatic views of the Harlem River. <clears throat> Aside from MRRP's dedicated staff, community volunteers play a dire role in supporting the restoration of High Bridge Forest. MYRP hosts countless volunteer events each year in High Bridge to assist with litter removal, invasive management, beautification, and native tree plantings. Our volunteers are a dire part of our strategy since we do not generally rely on chemical control. Sustained work by hand can have a transformative impact on the accessibility and ecology of even the most neglected forest. We are planning to consolidate our gains in the forest, diversify the understory, and develop our capacity to monitor for emergent th threats. This has been a critical way to develop the culture of land stewardship and build, know build a knowledge base that is necessary for resilient, thriving natural areas in our city. Uh, this photo is from a reforestation site a few years ago in the Laurel Hill section of High Bridge Park. Uh, it's roughly about a three acre patch where we planted roughly 1,500 trees, including 300 American chestnut hybrids, um, with the help of about 75 volunteers. Uh, so Forest Crew is an on -volun ongoing volunteer project that I've run from spring to fall every Sunday. Um, I classify this as kind of a more in-depth uh, volunteer event where you can learn uh, most of the stages of reforestation from ground up. Um, so if you come out a few times each, each season, you'll kind of learn the process of what we do. Uh, we typically start from uh, invasive removal from last year's planting sites and then move on to planting site prep and then typically planting trees in the, in the fall. Um, at Forest Crew, you will improve the health of the forest by identifying and removing invasive species, help build a more res resilient community of citizens who, who feel connected to the local green spaces, contribute to sustaining the natural New York ecosystem, uh, and learn about the methods of reforestation and species management with hands-on experience. Um, since 2017, we have hosted uh, 215 community volunteers. We've removed roughly 17,000 pounds of compost, planted 412 trees and shrubs, and removed uh, a little over 1,000 pounds of litter from the park. And this is just one of the photos from, from one of our forest crew events. Uh, and if you'd like to learn some more, MRP will be hiring uh, for some seasonal intern positions in 2020 for both sixth and eighth month positions uh, in our parks and gardens crew. So you can look for the uh, job postings on these websites, uh, usually around mid-January. Uh, thank you. Is there any questions? Uh, and we consider compost just invasive, uh, invasive species. We just any yeah we, we compost the invasive species that we take out of the park. So any any uh, organic matter that we take out of the park is considered compost for us. Uh, yeah, I mean, digging it up using hand tools, uh, things like that. We're just, we're out there uh, seven days a week just constantly working on it. And that's yes, it has been very effective for us. Yes? Yes. Uh, heavy equipment, very rarely. Um, 
We usually handle it, but I mean, we, we go through the safety precautions before we do any kind of event in the park. Um, make sure people keep their gloves on, stay off their hands and knees. If they see something like broken glass or you know rusted out metal, um, we typically just have them grab one of our staff members and notify us, and then we'll you know safely remove it. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, we, we do as well. Um, typically after a planting, we'll, we'll throw some grass seed down that has a nice native mixture in there. Um, but we, we will do more like ground cover plantings. Um, really what we have funding for for the year, so we'll incorporate it with. So you try to focus on what would have grown together in that area? Yes, correct. Okay. Yes? Uh, not necessarily. We actually don't have our own compost pile anymore. Um, a lot of what we're doing these days is just chopping it up very finely and letting it um, just go back onto the, onto the ground. Um, we will, with things like knotweed, if they're seeding out, we will remove them in trash bags and hopefully get them to a landfill. So it, it kind of depends on the species that we're removing. Uh, I think my director reached out to uh, the American Chestnut Foundation, I guess, I guess just to really see um, it, they're supposed to be blight resistant, and we had a, a nice chunk of land that we were planning on doing a reforestation project, um, so we just incorporated it into that. We thought it would be a really nice addition to the park, um, and hopefully in a couple of years we'll, we'll have the data to, to back up that these are blight resistant. Yes, I believe we have eight or nine different species of them. Um, and uh, every season we're doing data, you know, we're collecting data on them to, to see how their, their progress is going. So hopefully in a couple of years we'll know, uh, we'll know about the blight resistance. Uh, it's, it's a little bit of both. It really depends on the location that we're planting at as well, um, and just the needs of that location. But yes, it's, uh, we, we do like to plant the taller trees and then go back in and do some understory work, uh, as well as some ground covers. Uh, yes? Do you find that these times something particularly problematic trying to establish a perennial ground cover? Yes. <laughs> It's, yeah, I mean, it's a constant process. Um, like I said, we're at each of our sites uh, almost on a weekly basis in a constant rotation, uh, just continuously cutting them. Uh, but yes, I definitely find that to be a nuisance. Yeah. Sure. I'm sorry? Uh, just the gardener snakes. Uh, that's all we have there. Uh, no, I, I haven't seen any of this. Okay, so the Prism region is large. And so we're gonna move out of New York City and move to the Croton Aqueduct Trail. Uh, so we have Diane Alden. She's with the Friends of the Old Croton Aqueduct. And she is an arduent um, amateur naturalist. And Diane focuses on the management of invasive species and encourages native species on the Old Croton Aqueduct State Historic Park. She's a longtime member of the Friends of the Old Croton Aqueduct 
and currently a board member, and represents the Friends at the Lower Hudson Prism meeting. So welcome, Diane. Lights. The theme of my work on the Old Croton Aqueduct Trail has to do with communities, communities of people and the communities in the kingdoms of plants, animals, and fungi, and finding ways to intervene to support healthy interactions between them. My work on the trail has evolved over time since I bought my property that straddles this 26-mile linear New York State Park. When I became concerned about the vines strangling trees, I approached the state parks manager and pleaded for something to be done. After a few meetings, it became clear that if I really wanted the vines managed, I would have to take on this challenge myself. So I took myself off to a vine cutting event sponsored by the Bronx River Parkway Reservation Conservancy, led by Bob Del Tordo, and studied methods of vine removal. One thing led to another. I went to other invasive removal happenings, and eventually I joined the PRISM. I took classes on how to identify and survey a group of 26 invasive species from Linda Rowleader from the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference. And then I solicited volunteers, recruited state park interns, and in two years we had mapped the location, presence, and abundance of these 26 species. We have a whole book of it. So now what? After I joined the board of the Friends of the Old Croton Aqueduct, I proposed we canvass our members and suggest that those who live along the trail adopt a section to manage the invasive plants, not just the vines. Slow down, Diane, they said. Pick an area and do a demonstration site. So I chose the three mile northern stretch of the trail by my house, and in 2012, hosted the first I Love My Park Day on the first Saturday in May, anchored by Parks and Trails New York, which had initiated this annual event statewide. I recruited leaders from our local nature center, T-Town Lake Reservation, and convinced Bob to help. We invited neighbors who lived along the trail and people from surrounding communities, advertising that they would learn how to identify native species, how to remove them, and why it is so important to do that. 36 volunteers showed up and appreciated the opportunity to learn from Bob and the others, and they worked hard. We have made this an annual event on the first Saturday of May ever since, with gradually increasing attendance, 105 volunteers in each of the past two years. So, part of our secret of success is that we recruit experienced crew leaders. to serve as the experts. So there should be some standing up in this group. <laughs> Including botanists, ecologists, citizen scientists, so the volunteers learn from people in the know. I have kept my antenna out for potential leaders and recruited fellow PRISM members, folks affiliated with local nature organizations, invasive removal companies, local arborists, including Save a Tree, to participate and to lead teams. The volunteers go home energized and committed to removing invasive species from their properties. Many do return in subsequent years. We make this a fun event. We provide refreshments. Um, we set up workstations. We're very organized. We divide into teams and provide whatever tools and supplies are needed. And we have a popular lunch a prize drawing. There's our prize drawing. Okay. Go. There it is. Okay. So, how do we recruit the volunteers? That's a big question. Articles in local newspapers, postings on Facebook pages, e-blast members of the Friends, flyers at Metro North stations, libraries, 
local merchants, websites, Google groups, emails to previous participants, signs and flyers on the trail, publicity by collaborating organizations, plus lots of personal outreach, including people I meet on the trail. How do we prioritize our work? We focused on minimally invaded areas and gradually approached some of the more difficult ones over time, leaving some very challenging species and areas to their own devices. We studied best management practices and experimented. Emerging species have become a priority. Starting that first year and continuing to the present day, we include garlic mustard, Removal as one of our priorities, especially since it is known to exude a fungicide that disrupts the important relationship between native plant roots and beneficial soil fungi, which many plants depend on to thrive. Since we've been doing this for eight years, and I walk the trail almost daily, I have some findings to report. We had heard that if you pull garlic mustard in other invasive species, other invasive plants would show up on the trail in the disturbed soil. Well, it depends. Yes, when we pulled it from a sunny meadow, still grass emerged. Yes, it did. But in more shady, hilly, woodsy areas where we have been removing it and other invasive plants over the years, we are finding Christmas ferns dotting the hillside, interspersed with asters, goldenrods, and other native species. So the answer is choose your spots. Okay, vines, there we go, are very popular and satisfying to attack. We have learned to manage thick, bittersweet vines that were strangling trees. We have some surprisingly healthy stands of hemlock trees, surviving in part because we have freed them from the vines. Um, whole sections of the trail are now vine free, but we continue our work in other areas. Sometimes we cut and pull porcelain berry vines. We did that one year, saved some large stately trees from thickets of vines, and in so day doing, we daylighted a tall historic stone retaining wall that was in disrepair. So the following year, I recruited a stonemason to lead a group to restore that wall. This has become a popular endeavor every year since, with several stone walls repaired and others in progress. Why am I telling you this? Well, we have observed that where there are retaining walls on the east side of the trail, stabilizing steep hillsides, there is less erosion and more native species growing on those hillsides, often anchored by ferns. So, on the more eroded hillsides, where there are no stone walls or only crumbling ones, we find many more invasive plants and bushes taking over. So this coming year, our board is considering financing more stone wall repair, which we think will help with the invasives. Okay, barberry is another one of those invasive species that is everywhere. However, we have worked to pull and dig it from the edges of the trail knowing that research has demonstrated that it harbors ticks and we want to make the trail safer. This summer, I observed workers from the New York Health Department doing their annual tick survey of the trail. Who knew? I planned, to, I planned, hey, come back. I plan to see if I can find out if their results show a reduced population of ticks in the areas where we have worked. In one damp area, where thick, large thickets of barberry and other invasive plants were removed, skunk cabbage is emerging, along with whole stands of white flowered turtle head. When I used to walk on the trail, my eyes would gravitate to the invasive plants, and I would find myself strategizing which ones to target for management. Recently, though, I've started to admire the herbaceous plants that are starting to emerge. Gradually, along with native bushes that are flowering and setting seed. Take a look. When I told this to Jessica, she told me, what about the trees? Are there tree saplings growing on the trail in the understory to potentially replace the stately trees gracing the trail? 
Well, so now I've been looking for them, and guess what? I have been finding them. Lots, all different sizes. How is that possible with our local deer population? So I called the manager of the fenced in 103, 110-acre horse farm that abuts the trail. Yes, he told me. He has been allowing hunters on the property for a number of years. This is a very unscientific report for sure, but it's a piece of evidence that I offer you. Some areas we have cleared over the years have remained barren. Planet Wild, with Amanda Bailey to the rescue, donated 500 plants and collaborated with other experienced plant people to add this very popular experience to our event. We emphasize plants that are already thriving on the trail, many of them deer resistant, and planted sedges, goldenrod, asters, ferns on the shady slope, watered by a neighbor's hose. There are places where there are still stretches where more intensive restoration is in order. One heavily invaded section in a gully was tackled by an ambitious crew, a very ambitious crew leader this year, who I think is out there, with a plan to do restoration planting. And there she is. We planted buttonbush, redbud, silky dogwood, and discovered that beneath all those thickets of invasive bushes that had been removed, asters and white snake root were now re-emerging. So we are planning to attack stiltgrass next season in some areas where it has not yet completely taken over, hoping to do so when the timing is just right. Mimi and her friends are planning to come help after winning a tour in the aqueduct from me at an auction. I never miss an opportunity to recruit more volunteers. <laughs> so, now that the demonstration site is perking along and we are making good progress, we are hoping to circle back to my original idea and encourage aqueduct neighbors in other communities to get involved and manage invasive plants and restore with native species. Some are planning to do that in Hastings and pollinator pathways enthusiasts are gearing up in Irvington to motivate community members and have contacted me. So, as my call to action, I challenge you to gather together a group of neighbors or connect with a local garden club and plan to do some invasive removal and restoration planting on your own properties. And if you near, live near the aqueduct trail, adopt a small section and extend your plantings to the edges of the trail so they will naturalize and blend in with permission from the park manager, of course. This is an opportunity for community building in your own neighborhoods. Host a brunch, study together, embark on a project. So here are some resources for you, and I have a, um, a little poster with the same information out on the table. And it says, um, Westchester Community College's Native Plant Center. I corrected that on the one out on the table. So I've also, tried to educate the board of the Friends of the Old Croton Aqueduct, and they've sort of come around now to really be interested in not only the history of the aqueduct, which is their specialty, but also in invasive plant removal and restoration. So we're gearing up to do some extensive vine removal with some funding, because although I'm really good at getting volunteers, we can't do all of this with just volunteers. So we're looking for funding, and I think the board is going to step up. So that's the end. up as volunteers with the, um, they don't really sign a waiver, but they sign up with the state parks, and um, the state parks provides them with workman's comp and other liability. So no, we sign them up properly, and we get photo releases.
Well, we use a lot of methods. We do a lot of, we do a lot of, we use a lot of methods. We um, do a lot of pulling. We have a weed wrench, which can even get out lots of barberry and even the euonymus bushes. Um, we also work with the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference, which joins us on I Love My Park Day. So there are places where we cut and then they paint the cut stumps with herbicides. So we do do that. We also um, have them come in between I Love My Park Day. We have other events. We've gotten the New York State Invasive Strike Force come and partner with the New Jersey Trail Conference. So we do a lot of cutting and then they can paint the cut stumps. But mostly we pull and dig. That's a very good question. Um, the garlic mustard we bag and we send to the incinerator. I'm not sure we're supposed to do that, but we don't want to compost it because of the chemicals that they'll put back into the soil. Um, other, the state parks crew comes, we put a lot of the debris along the edges of the trail and then the state parks come with a flail mower and they just chop everything up and we leave it on the sides. Um, we try to time it. We're doing most of our events in May when things are not um, fruiting, so we are watching that we don't encourage spread by the way we're doing it. But we think we're doing it okay and I'm watching and it seems to be good. Yes. Right here in front here. Okay, we don't have any good plants plans for the still grass, except that there are some sections where it's just starting to encroach, and since we have the large group of really young kids who came for that walk with me and they just loved pulling it and it's easy to pull. So we're gonna pick some very targeted sections where it hasn't taken over, but where it's starting and we're gonna pull and bag it at the exact right time just before it's going to spread its seeds. And we're also trying to work with the state parks mowing crew to get them to mow at the right time. Yes, um, I'm not sure that I've developed the expertise, but we're reaching out to people to help us figure that out. Okay, Matthew's gonna be working with me and he's got lots of expertise and he's gonna help us with that. Yes. We choose deer resistant plants. And as I mentioned, I think we have less of a deer problem right now than we've had in past years because this um, 110 acre horse farm right by the trail where I'm working, they have been allowing hunting. And I am seeing much less evidence of deer. I have a lawn, which I'm gradually reducing over time, but I'm seeing many, many fewer deer pellets than I have in past years. So I don't know whether it's the coyotes that I'm seeing in my area or whether it's the hunting that's taking place across the road. We, the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference comes and works with us on I Love My Park Day and they are qualified and they do do cut stump treatment. So they do do that. It's, I've watched them do it. It's so 
carefully done with gloves and they just paint the particular area. So um, that's what we're doing. Bless you. Okay, so next up, we are moving across Westchester County over to Rye, uh, where Kevin Pereno is the executive director of the Jay Heritage Center. And he is going to present on a big project that they've been working on to restore the Jay Meadow. So welcome, Kevin. Thanks, Jessica. I'm Kevin Perino, as she said. I'm the executive director of the Jay Heritage Center in Rye. Uh, this is our beloved historic site. Um, it's, uh, if you haven't been, it's the, the boyhood home of the founding father, John Jay. Um, this building was, was built in 1838 by his son. Um, and this is kind of on the shore of Long Island Sound. That's Glen Cove, just across uh, Long Island Sound there. And it's now a, a 23 acre park. In, in John Jay's day, this was a 400 acre estate. We have 23 acres now. And um, so that's the, the property. John Jay, just to give you a real quick um, briefing on John Jay, he was uh, uh, one of the important founding fathers. He was the only founding father to have served in all three branches of government. He was uh, first Chief Justice of the US. Um, he, was, uh, he was a diplomat, helped negotiate the end of the Revolutionary War, um, uh, governor of New York, so a really important um, figure in, uh, in American history. And he also happened to be an avid gardener. If you look at his, you read his letters and his papers, um, they are dotted with references to seeds that he's found in various places, like, like a lot of the founding fathers. And um, so he did a lot of planting uh, at the Jay Estate as well. Now, we have, I showed you a picture of the buildings, but um, the meadow um, in, or the, um, the, the meadow in behind the estate that rolls down is actually the oldest human managed meadow in New York State. Um, our archaeologists have found there not only Native American artifacts, but Paleo Indian artifacts that go back eight and 10,000 years. Um, these are like little chert flakes, primitive um, tools um, that, that were used there. So we take our, the responsibility of stewardship, not just of the property, but the meadow and the entire area um, very seriously. Um, and we want to, not, not as, as Dr. Talamy said, to restore some kind of pristine past, but to try to create something um, sustainable and keep it as a, a functioning ecosystem. So this is an aerial shot. That's the, the kind of white dot. Uh, I don't know if I have the, there it is. There's the house. And Meadow goes down to the shore. And the reason I included this slide is that's the Boston Post Road there. Um, but um, I think it was Dr. Westbrooks was saying invasive species are only one boat ride away. Well, there's another road here that you see. This is Milton Harbor and Long Island Sound that goes. Um, and that's how invasive species came in in John Jay's day. It's the other major artery um, to the estate. So th this is what it looked like in John Jay's time. Um, this is the farmhouse um, where he grew up. This is, you can see, the kind of the vegetable gardens here. And in, in Jay's day, the founding fathers saw um, native species uh, not, you know, they, they saw it as a political act, planting native species. And they wanted, they saw planting native species as a kind of declaration of independence from the old world. And so you hear them uh, in their letters writing a lot about it. Um, and, uh, and they did plant those things. Um, and, but they also planted things like this, white mulberry. This was um, uh, John Jay. There's a letter from 1792 of Jay um, writing a lot about um, these mulberry seeds that he, that, that he had found and, and um, sent. And John Jay, he died in, uh, in 1829, but um, the estate was, um, was inherited by his son, Peter Augustus Jay. And um, uh, Peter Augustus Jay, what, one of the things that he did on the estate, and I'll, I'll explain a little later on how this relates to invasive species, but he created these um, dry laid ha ha walls. And they're really amazing. And when landscape architects come to, to visit the site, more than anything, this is what they're most excited about. Um, they were, I'll give you, there's another, 
view of it. This is the estate in the 1850s, um, and um, these were these were an, an innovation. Uh, I don't know if you've read Andrea Wolf uh, wrote a book called Founding Gardeners, and she said these haha walls were the, um, the the most revolutionary gardening innovation of the 18th century. Um, what they did essentially is they 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 kind of united beauty and utility, and they kept. Um, it, it, they acted as kind of an infinity pool. You could look straight across them and have a, a straight, as kind of a straight line, but there was a ditch on the other side and it, um, it kept the animals from crossing. And so um, they had a kind of a dual purpose and we have um, a, a ton of them in, in decent shape um, that we're restoring. This is John Clarkson Jay, the grandson of John Jay. I'm showing these just by trying to give you a sense of over the, the decades that the Jay family was here, they all had an impact on the landscape in various ways. John Clarkson Jay happened to be married um, to a woman whose father was a major merchant um, in New York. He brought a lot of invasive species um, into the estate um, as well. Multiflora rose is one example. This is just a shot I kind of like. This is from kind of John Clarkson Jay's time down to the water, and you get a sense of um, how the landscape, if you've been to the estate. I don't, has anybody been to the, the Jay estate? Yeah, okay, so a lot of people, but um, you know it's quite, quite a bit more wooded. There's a lot of invasive Norway maples. There's all kinds of stuff there now in Jay's time, um, and in the 18th century, it was a lot more open. This is another way. This is a map um, showing the, the orchard, the meadow. It's a, 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 one more way that we have a sense of what was, what was going on there historically. Mary Rutherford Jay, another leading garden architect, both inspired by the landscape and, um, uh, uh, and um, used, it as, used it as inspiration. Um, and so, again, this is all, all by way of explaining that um, the Jay family, over the 159 years that they were there, had a major impact on the place, both, um, both good and also in introducing uh, invasive species. Uh, the estate was sold in 1911, um, er, in, in 1904. Later owners planted um, this elm LA. And this is another addition. This is by a later owner, Edgar Palmer. Um, this is our, our beautiful meadow. He put an airstrip in there just to, you know, so he could get, get uh, to and fro. And then in the 80s, um, in the late 20th century, the estate was sold to a developer. And this is when the invasive species really began to run riot because the estate was abandoned for a long time. And you can really see it um, in this picture. I mean, it was gray gardens. It was, it, it was really run down. Things were stolen from the house. And as far in, in terms of the landscape of the place, things went wild. And um, this is, a, this is one, one photo. These are our, our beautiful ha-ha walls covered in invasives. Another shot there. I think that's Japanese stilt grass in the foreground. There's another. I mean, these are these are just a few of the many um, that occupy the Jay Estate. Wineberry, uh, Japanese barberry. I think that is mugwort. And so, so one of the things that we've tried to do is we have a couple of big projects going on that are restoring some native plantings to the estate. Thomas Waltz um, has designed and we've, we've completely funded this um, garden that we're putting in in the spring. It's just a, uh, some slides you can kind of see. We're, again, making nods to the past. The parterre gardens kind of, you know, they, 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 they you know, they echo some of the past um, designs. Um, and this is, a, this is the example of what's going to be there up on the upper left. Reflecting pool in a second garden room. It's a series of three garden rooms. Third garden room has uh, a rose arbor and these native pollinator plants um, uh, that will be planted there as well. Um, so, we're, so as part of, not only are we trying to remove the invasives that were there, but we're trying to restore some, some native pollinators to the garden as well. And then what's kind of exciting is side by side, we have this meadow that's right next to the garden. Larry Weiner um, has installed it. And it's, um, 
there's, you know, he's planted all kinds of um, uh, native flowers. There's Coreopsis, there's um, uh, black-eyed Susan, uh, coneflower, sedges, all kinds of things. And this is the second year that I, I think he, he started it two years ago. And it was exciting this year. We've still got, I mean, there's still a lot of mugwort in the meadow. Um, there's, there's still a lot of things that we don't want going on there. But um, we're starting to see all kinds of stuff coming up this year. And it was, kind of, it was really exciting. Um, to see. Um, one uh, kind of neat thing about this is in the meadow, the, the meadow and the, the garden that I was showing you with the three garden rooms are right next to each other. And so Larry has, has designed it with kind of drifts of these native pollinators in the meadow. So it looks as if they've kind of escaped into the meadow. So these are just a few we're talking about. Examples. This is Larry doing his work. And um, so, but above all, I mean, what we, we, our, our goal is not just to, you know, it's not just a historic site. It's not just a garden. What we really wanted to try to take to heart is to use this place as an education center and to teach students that come to visit. These, I think, are middle school students. We do a lot of field trips for middle, middle school students. Um, depending on their age, um, we can, you know, it's very easy to, to walk, even little kids, even preschoolers come and we'll walk them around and show them the various, you know, we can show them stilt grass and show them the mugwort and the various things that are growing there. Um, and older students, we, we teach to use apps like iNaturalist and, and you know, can be a little bit more sophisticated about what we teach. But we really want to bring people um, here. This is another thing we do. You know, this is an example of we'll do workshops um, here on invasive species. Um, we've had speakers, some of those, some, some people from the Botanical Garden. I think, Jessica, you were, you were there to speak on the, on the topic um, at one point a couple of years ago. Um, I love my park day. We've got, I don't know if that's a bundle of, what is that in the back? Um, but um, pulling uh, all day uh, garlic mustard. And a fun thing that we do with this, I don't know, does anybody know Tama Matsuoka Wong? Yeah, so she wrote this book, Foraged Flavor. And she kind of, she, she gathers, she'll come um, from time to time and she'll gather invasive species and um, she'll, she'll lead workshops, and she sells them sometimes to the big kind of fancy restaurants in New York to make cocktails out of you know, garlic mustard or whatever. And, um, but she does, she does a lot of education, and my daughter and I did it. We picked um, last spring at this I Love My Parks Day, we picked garlic mustard all day, pulled garlic mustard all day, went home and made a pesto from Tama's cookbook about it. Um, we, cooked a, we cooked a mugwort soup, um, and if... <laughs> I can, the only thing I can say about the mugwort soup is put a lot of Tabasco in it because um, it's uh, it is not good. Um, and but you know so but it's a, but it's a fun education tool. And now you know my seventh grader and the, the people that we that we teach learn a little bit about invasive species. And so this is this is good old John Jay with an iPhone. Um, I think you know John Jay in his time I think would have you know he would have put. Uh, quill to paper when he was writing to George Washington about his rhubarb plants or whatever seeds that, that he had found. But I think he would have liked uh, tools like iNaturalist and uh, IMAP Invasives because um, the founding fathers really were in, you know, when you read their letters, they're really in communication all the time, talking about seeds, native plants, um, various things, agriculture in general. So I think they would have been very pleased um, uh, to get in, involved. And I think they would have been uh, really pleased with, with forums like this, where you can get, get people together and talk about a lot of these issues. So thanks very much. Yes. Well, there really isn't a whole lot of lawn left, to be honest. Um, uh, to, the, we've uh, we've planted this meadow. There's just a very kind of thin slice of lawn, to be on, to be honest with you. Um, and it has to be. I mean, it does have to be the meadow that we were talking about that I was showing you does have to be mowed from time to time um, at this at this uh, stage in the installation. And so uh, it 
it looks like a lawn every now and then, you know, at various times uh, of the year, but, but there really isn't a whole lot of lawn. Yes. 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 Yeah. Thanks for the question. It's a there. There was the garden. Uh, it's, the slide is probably too far back to go now. Um, but in John Jay's time, there was a vegetable garden in the area. There, there is right now kind of the ruins of a stone wall, parts of the haha, -ha and um, ruins of other stone walls. And those were those are probably. Uh, 1920s, 1930s uh, stone walls, and and there's not much there right now. I mean, the garden hasn't begun to be um, installed, and it's just it's kind of parts of it are overgrown. There's a the the remains of a uh, a one-time uh, uh, pool that uh, skateboarders like to use. So we put up a little fence to keep the skateboarders out of the pool. Um, but um, but that's what it is right now. It's just kind of the relics of past gardens waiting to be. Uh, Restored. Yes. I was wondering what stopped the developer? It seemed to be such a prime piece of real estate where a, you know, a McMansion could go up. Do you know the history there? Yeah, I mean, it was it, far before my time, but they. This was um, before I was involved with the J. But um, there was a group of neighbors who got together and they formed something called the J Coalition. Um, and they raised a lot of awareness about the place, the history of the place, um, the environmental impact of what, what the development would have on its right. As, as somebody said, it's right um, abuts marshlands, which is, um, so um, it would have, development would have had an impact on marshlands as well. And so I think that was, I think, I think the biggest thing was the environmental impact, um, and, but there was also, you know, there was a lot of sensitivity also to the, it was an important historic site. Okay, thanks very much. Great, thank you, Kevin. Okay, so um, next up, we're continuing north in the Prism region, and we're heading to Tuxedo Park. And there's some fun facts there in a, an old relationship between this property here, the New York Botanical Garden, that was protected by the Lori Lord family um, and built their stone mill here on site and had their industry here. But they also helped develop uh, Tuxedo Park. So there's quite a unique relationship between us and Tuxedo Park. And Christopher Gao is going to talk about the restoration of the abandoned Tuxedo Park horse racing track into a native meadow. Welcome, Christopher. Well, thank you. Um, I just want to segue into this. Um, and uh, I'm not a jealous person, but I think perhaps I am, because my colleagues, the number of volunteers that they've rounded up to help with their projects is, is, is very impressive. We have about six volunteers in our project, but um, we still have a great success. So, um, oh. so the racetrack, uh, 2016, we um, um, started this project in Tuxedo Park, which um, it's 20 minutes west of the Tappan Zee Bridge in Orange County, New York, is where it's located, an area full of forests, water, and iron ore. So in the 18th century, there, there were iron foundries that would uh, produce, for example, the links of the, the great, or the, no, the grand chain, no, the great chain, that was strung across the Hudson to stop the British um, ships go upstream during the, um, the War of the American Revolution. Um, I guess that was like the first Brexit, and hopefully the last. <laughs> but in, here in the, um, in the 19th century, Tuxedo Park owed its um, um, the origins uh, not to the iron industry, but to agriculture. And this was the crop. Can anyone guess what crop that is? Tobacco, tobacco exactly. So it was the, the tobacco that was the um, um, used for snuff and um, cigarettes. And as Jessica said, the snuff was done in this mill 10 minutes from here in part of the New York Botanical Gardens, the Lillian and Amy Goldman stoned mill. 
and <laughs> oh, <laughs> the stone mill. Uh, so the snuff was um, uh, gra ground here. The tobacco, we're thinking, no, was it grown in Tuxedo Park? No, it was the profits of the Lorillard family who owned this that purchased Pierre Lorillard. He had a house, a cottage up in Newport, and he sold his cottage, it was called the Breakers. He sold it to Mr. <laughs> Vanderbilt, and with that he purchased the land in, uh, around Tuxedo Park as a hunting lodge and a, a hunting ground. Um, he had his friends, fancy friends, come up and build all sorts of uh, houses and stables. Um, and this is the Poor House in Tuxedo Park, named as such because of uh, Henry Poor, who was the founder of the uh, Standard & Poor's Financial Index. <laughs> they had extensive gardens, lots of gardens, uh, gardeners. They were housed in, a, this is a gardener's cottage. They were well looked after. This was that the, the garden, that uh, garden uh, cottage occupant had to look after. This is what it looks like now. <clears throat> and so a lot of fun, a lot of horseplay, a lot of money. Um, so they wanted to um, have a horse track. They started off as a polo field, but they developed this horse racing track. Uh, this, was, this is what it looked like in its heyday. And um, a lot of fancy people came, such as <clears throat> this lady. Can anyone recognize Jackie? Okay. Yes. So she came, and, and here's a picture of her dad on the left. And this was in the society papers, and it was uh, titled Mr. and Mrs. Bouvier and Friend. But it was Mr. Bouvier, Mistress and Friend. <laughs> so that's, that sealed the divorce. So that was the end of their marriage. <laughs> And around about that time, that was also the end of the racetrack. In 1941 was the last uh, horse race, and it became abandoned and used um, about 20 years ago in a major storm. The Department of Public Works used it as um, a staging ground for all the downed trees, and that morphed into a dumping ground for the landscapers and the gardeners. And so it became 23 acres of uh, invasive species. Um, but we, um, there were, the in, uh, inventories were done uh, of it and they were re realized there were a lot of good uh, native plants there. Because of the topography, um, it was like a valley, it's a bowl, and there was um, um, uh, the, the different soil types, the different aspects, the topography and the hydrology created quite a, a range of interesting environments for native species. So Bowman Hill... Um, Nature um, Wildflower Preserve came up to do an inventory um, of about 275 species. Uh, some were quite rare that they weren't in the, um, the State Museum of Hudson Highlands inventory. But the majority was invasive species such as Miscanthus, the Chinese silver grass, which was becoming a monoculture. So uh, we, 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 um, we call this the bittersweet path. Um, we, created a bar, path through it, but not so much because of the bittersweet, the Celastus vine, is that it was a sweet experience walking through it, but it highlighted all the other invasives, so that was a little bit bitter, so that's why we call it the bittersweet. We decided um, to, uh, we had an inventory done by one of our colleagues in PRISM, Tom Lewis of Trillium, of, um, Trillium Invasive Species Management. Um, we tried to do some mechanical, some uh, removal without relying on herbicides. We covered the goutweed with tarps, but it was like toothpaste that they squeezed out at the edges. The, we uh, trimmed the, um, the Japanese um, stilt grass. We uh, hand pulled the mile a minute. There's one of the volunteers. <laughs> <laughs> and we even did um, pulls of garlic mustard, and with my finely tuned British culinary skills, made uh, gar pesto, which was awful. Uh, <laughs> the uh, Phragmites, we contacted um, further upstate in uh, the Gomez Hill Museum in Marlborough, New York, um, with rethatching their cottage um, using common reed, Phragmites. So we asked if, uh, if he would like to come and harvest the Phragmites. He said no, that he, prefer, he prefers the Turkish type, which is a little bit more <laughs> aggressive. And um, 
And then we had a problem with the, 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 the vines, the salastras. So we started, um, the few volunteers we could muster, we gave them a hat um, and we called them the diviners, <laughs> which caused a lot of confusion because people thought we were divining for water or we were some religious cult. Um, so we cleared that up um, until we got this vol latest volunteer, Rick, uh, who helped us between his shifts on his day job. So, <laughs> so the confusion came back again. So that's maybe why we have few volunteers. So, but very satisfying work, as you know, before and after. And we had help from a local entrepreneur who lent us his cherry picker and, and crew. Um, but then we had to use the herbicides. So the um, Japanese angelica tree, um, if you cut it, as, this, as you, you cut it here, you see where there was one, there's 10, um, because of that long root system underneath. And so you have to dig out all the root, uh, remove every single bit, otherwise it's just gonna come back with a vengeance. Um, and you can't see the uh, forest for the Japanese angelica trees. Uh, Japanese knotweed, we, um, we did gly glyphosate injections into the stems and spraying on the, on the leaves. Um, so once we had finished with the herbicide um, um, process, we got a forest mulcher, a handy dandy um, um, machine that went around and macerated everything in sight. Um, so it went the, the porcelain berry, the multiflora rose, the Japanese barberry uh, were cut. Um, the maceration, not leaving clean break, helped a little bit in it not coming back. But um, a broadcast herbicide uh, had to be used. Uh, that would be, we, this was being financed privately. Um, we couldn't get any grants because it's a gated community. So we, um, we'd engaged Larry Wiener, Landscape Associates, and to create a native meadow. And, um, and there was, we could have done a, a, a year of Sundays of removing all these invasives and we wouldn't have made progress. And because we had a financial responsibility from the donors, we had to go ahead and after many discussions and many town halls about the um, use of herbicides, we used the herbicides to uh, knock the invasives out. Um, oh dear, well there we go, we knocked them out. So we had a clean slate um, and we had a plan with, um, of the different ecotones, the different areas, the different, um, um, the different plantings would be involved. Here's the, uh, the, some, of the, some of the species that were going to be put in we, with the seeding. And then live planting. These are some of the plants we put in. And this was, um, does anyone know what this is? I don't know whether it worked. It's coyote blood and guts. So when we, uh, when we had the, uh, these um, new, um, um, this was like a smorgasbord for the deer, uh, fresh, from the, fresh, fresh from the nursery. Most, uh, some of them are deer resistant, but in a, in a treat like this, so that's why we uh, put the, uh, that. Uh... Anyway, so the, we, um, the migratory birds, we, they started to come back, and the nesting birds, so um, we had sightings of this, and then obviously we were happy, but so were the predators. So the food chain was complete. Here's some of the views of uh, what the meadow is looking like now after two, uh, after two years. How am I doing for time? Yeah. Um, we mow now once a year. We keep uh, everything for winter interest. At the end of the winter, in March, we'll do one mowing so that the spring um, the growth can, can come through. So how did we do all this? Well, we um, were a population, there's 600 people that live in, uh, in Tuxedo Park. Um, so a lot of, um, as you could see with that historical aspect of the park, the, um, there were handles like that that we used to draw people in. Most of the people in the park couldn't, yes, they were there because of the trees, but as soon as they would buy their houses, they would chop the trees down so they could get a lovely view. So they weren't quite, didn't have that sensitivity that we all have about Mother Nature. So it was somehow convincing them, getting them down there. That was the challenge. So these historical aspects uh, about the, um, uh, the, the park. Uh, just yesterday, we finished unearthing a, um, um, a stone wall ch steeplechase that was used for horse jumping. And so there's a few equestrian people in the, in the park. 
brought them down to discuss it with them, and they were so excited. So they opened their wallets uh, to, uh, to a fund. So it's these little handles that we're looking for to, to, to finance. So we do, um, we do um, um, uh, plaques with the people's names on that donate the money, the meadow stewards. Um, one of the local residents is an artist, May Shaw. She did this fabulous woodblock print, an edition of 150. And so we framed that and sold them um, for $500. And we, had, we sold 75 of them, so that was... Then we did a whole exhibition around it. These are the actual carved wood blocks to make the wood block print. Uh, so that brought in a, an artistic um, uh, people that were in, into art. Um, and then thanks to the New York Botanical Gardens, I took um, a training with Daniel Ather to do herbarium pressing. So I collected, dried, pressed, mounted and framed um, species from the racetrack to make herbarium. So anytime someone dates, uh, donates $150, they get one of these. And then we did a, an appeal with the Hudson Seed Company, a great organization. The chap that founded it, he was a librarian, and he would check out native seeds to people. And you would bring, the return date would be the next year when you'd bring back the seeds from the plants that germinated. So we did a, um, a fundraising with the, some milkweed seeds, um, which the kids loved, and the kids were great vectors in telling their parents what to do, the right thing to do. So there's the milkweed. There's a, well, he's not on, milk, on a milkweed, the monarch butterfly, but um, we engaged the local schools. Um, one of the obstacles was ticks. A lot of people, 75% of the people would not go in the park because of ticks. So we created this wonderful stone bench on this witch hazel overlook so they could sit there in safety and enjoy the, uh, <laughs> the meadow. The other things we did were the Department of Environmental Conservation, uh, trees for trips, planting uh, trees and vegetation along riparian buffers, along rivers and lakes uh, with all native species. We did tabling at the uh, local farmers markets and railway stations. We keep up trees that have been lobotomized by the utility companies <laughs> because the angry people that are so uh, upset about it come and find us and it's a great segue into a conversation about conversation, about doing the right thing. So they are great magnets uh, to get people. Because um, this is what it's all about. This is the success story that we've found is is getting these people um, being able to um, work uh, like with a compromise and uh, find the right balance to engage these people so they can listen to these compelling environmental necessities that we need um, and in order for them uh, to, to understand that in, and then open up their wallets. Here we had a dam, uh, dam work done. We had to remove all the trees because of the, you cannot have trees on a dam because if the tree fails, it rips up the whole dam. It's counterintuitive, but that's the, the, the so that would cause, a, that, that got a new influx of, of, of people as well. Um, we, instead of seeding just grass, we seeded wildflowers on the meadow. Um, and rounding up, this was uh, when we drained, and in another in historical fact that was fascinating, this is a corduroy road that George Washington built with his Continental Army going up, up, um, up north to fight the Brits again. Uh, and so this was revealed when the water level was reduced in the reservoir. So we have our own, um, um, we have our own sort of 20th, 21st century version of the grand chain, the great chain. We have this, this, this um, barrier to stop the um, Eurasian milfoil that we have these aquatic invasive species as well. And, and every time I look out at the lake when we have these blue algal blooms, it reminds me of the, the smoky origins and the tobacco roots of Tuxedo Park. And the, that a good, a bad thing can turn into good. Uh, and so that's what we're, the, what we're trying to do um, with, uh, with um, Tuxedo Park. And um, we've had um, good success so far. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Chris. And we are 
moving now across the river uh, to Vassar College in Poughkeepsie, where Carrie Van Camp uh, works at the Vassar Ecological Preserve uh, right there in Poughkeepsie at Vassar Campus. And she's going to talk about prioritizing and protecting conservation targets. Welcome, Carrie. Hi. Um, yeah, today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, how we're starting to manage invasive species at Vassar College. Um, I manage the ecological preserve, which is about 400 acres of open space. It's just adjacent to the college. We have an educational mission. Um, the space is kept um, as undeveloped just to be there for students to learn about nature. Um, so it's widely used by Vassar students in the sciences, but um, we're also working to get students engaged across the curriculum. Um, it's also heavily used by the community. We estimate we have about 20,000 visitors a year. And it's a site that's, that was really in need of an invasive species management plan. Um, here you can see an aerial photo of our site. And it's in a highly fragmented um, landscape, both in, set in both the city and town of Poughkeepsie. Um, it was a working farm until the mid-1950s. Uh, so there's uh, heavy, di heavy disturbance in our land use history. Um, we've had high densities of deer as our forest is redeveloped. And it's also heavily used by people. And that's kind of led to a situation where there are pieces of our site that look um, like what you see here. It's a, it's a forest that's collapsing under the weight of vines. Um, so this was overwhelming as a land manager <laughs> with very little resources. Um, and so it was a couple of years ago that we decided to partner with Hike Preserve, which is in Rensselaerville, New York, um, a really lovely nature preserve that um, is relatively uninvaded. Um, and we partnered on this. Um, uh, grant to the Land Trust Alliance to take both of our sites through a conservation action planning process. And this um, process was, de was developed by the Nature Conservancy to standardize how land managers can make um, decisions about conservation and really prioritize what they're doing on their site. So um, when we were getting into this, I was like, oh, OK. Um, it seemed like an easier task for Hike than us. But um, it's been a great partnership. And this is kind of an overview of what that process looked like. First, we had to identify what it was we were trying to conserve. Um, and as we did that, we needed to identify the attributes of those targets that we, we really needed to preserve. Um, so what was it that made those targets uh, important ecologically? And once we did that, um, we had to think about the barriers um, to, to those conservation targets and what what factors are contributing um, to our ability to conserve that. And once we thought that through, we could, we could move on to developing a work plan to overcome those barriers. Um, so we knew that we wanted to try to conserve communities that weren't too far gone. They were relatively, um, relatively uninvaded. Um, and to try to preserve the native plants that still exist, existed on our site. We had some locations we knew we had rare plants and rare ecological communities, so we wanted to focus our efforts there. Um, and because of our mission, um, we wanted to make sure that we continued to have the diversity of habitats. Uh, so we wanted to have early successional habitats as well as forests and wetlands. Um, this is an example of what our conservation targets look like um, for our forests. Uh, we thought about the targets at different scales, so at the forest corridor scale, at the kind of hydric scale, wet and wetlands and upland forests, and also at the community level. And underneath each of these, you can see the ecological attributes that we were thinking about, what we really wanted to preserve, things like forest structure, forest regeneration, um, and species composition at the community level. Um, and What's important in regards to our invasive species management plan is that invasive species are, are a direct threat to all these attributes. And so when we did the threat analysis for our site, it was invasive species and climate change that came out to be the biggest threats to conservation. Um, so we sat around a lot and talked about how invasive species were making it to our preserve. Uh, we knew that there were materials that were being moved around site by our facilities folks. And um, we had people dropping off domestic animals. Um, uh, hikers moving seeds around on their boots and researchers not pro pro practicing proper sanitation and 
possibly moving things around our site. Uh, we're across the street from Vassar College, which is an arboretum and the source of uh, nearly all of the newly emerging invasive species that we're finding on our site. So um, that was a problem. And uh, we also had um, machinery moving things around. So um, once we thought about all those contributing factors, we went about developing an action plan. And we really wanted to focus on preventing the introduction of new, new invasives, eradicating things that were just starting to emerge, and then reducing the abundance of widespread species. Like I said, it was a pretty a pretty overwhelming site, so within that reduction of abundance of widespread species, we really had to prioritize. We weren't, we aren't able to do everything. Um, and we discovered that there was a lot that we could do through outreach. Um, there was a lot internally at Vassar that we were kind of not speaking to each other across campus and kind of causing each other to have more work. So things like working with the Arboretum Committee to think about what's being planted and removing seed sources of these plants that we're finding escaping into our forests. Um, working with facilities on sanitation, um, security on just enforcing rules. And um, then we've also been trying to focus on how to reach the community uh, using student interns um, to offer guided walks to the public, um, doing tabling, going to summer camps to teach kids, hoping that kind of transfers on to their parents. Um, and our interns also did uh, presentations to municipalities, so trying to think about, because uh, we have easements on our site and, and um, the town and city are also moving things about um, and we're thinking about doing some direct mailings to our neighbors. I was pretty excited to hear about the idea of doing consultations. I think that might be something we can do with students. So that was a really great idea. Um, and there were a few things we thought we could do on our own, installing some boot brush stations. Um, and uh, we set up a pretty extensive monitoring protocol because we knew that if we were going to stop these emerging invasives as, as they were coming, we needed to be able to find them. Um, so all of those points were places we surveyed um, on our site. and. Um, yeah, while we were doing it, we also uh, took the opportunity to document our common invasive species. Uh, so here you have a map that shows our emerging invasives. Um, and you can see they're pretty distributed around our site. Um, what I think is interesting about this is um, the linden viburnum, the sapphire berry, the jet bead, the castor aurelia are all things that we can trace back to being um, found in our arboretum. So these are things we planted at Vassar that now we're taking the time and effort to try to manage. Um, the chocolate vine was escaped from a neighbor that was dumping landscaping debris on our property. So the, you can see the population emerging from that um, edge of our property line. And the typha laxmani, or, or we call it the kitty tail. It's a tiny little cat tail. Um, it seemed to be coming from a place where there was a former composting site. So we suspect that was dumped there as well. Um, we also developed these removal priorities for our common invasives. Uh, there were some species we thought we could contain. That list is growing shorter as we're trying to do it. Um, as places with rare species, and um, we wanted to protect those and make sure they stayed at our site. Uh, we used drone flyovers to identify canopy gaps, in particular with uh, the loss of ash from our forest, which is occurring right now. Uh, we wanted to manage, and as those gaps were opening up, to try to encourage uh, native regeneration. Uh, we're looking at the edges of our priority corridor, uh, forested corridor. Um, and we haven't gotten this far, but we'd like to just do management in our priority communities and along trails, but hopefully someday. Um, and we plan on restoring in areas where we're doing management, and we're thinking a lot about uh, how we can do that in the context of climate change and improving diversity at our site. Um, the way we've done management, we uh, were able to get the PRISM uh, strike force to come, and so that's been the way uh, this past summer we were able to use chemical control to control some of those emerging invasives at our site. Um, we've used goats. We're kind of experimenting with them to see if they might be an option for places where um, it's really far gone, um, so really we can't even get in there. The vines are so dense. And we use students um, to do monitoring and management. Um, and that's just really mechanical control. We've been good, fairly good at engaging undergraduates in doing this through summer research, uh, internships that we were able to get uh, some invasive species interns with the help of the Lower Hudson Prison this past summer. They did amazing work on outreach and management. 
Uh, we are engaging some students through the intensives, uh, which is a new type of coursework where they get hands-on experience, um, and through work study. Um, and this is a place we could obviously grow. It's a capacity issue. Um, but this is the workforce that's <laughs> readily available to us. Um, uh, we've been pretty successful at doing some large service projects by partnering with the Student Conservation Association. We've done two of those in 2013 and 2018. And those were the times we were able to get big numbers, like we had 200 volunteers and planted 1,000 trees and removed acres of spe invasive species. But all of these were kind of single events, and we weren't able to maintain any of those volunteer bases. And so something I'm hoping we can do in the future is try to develop a volunteer base that can come back and really develop a relationship with our site. Um, we would like to diversify the, the groups that we're having work on our site. Um, I'm hoping that if we can start to have regular meetups that we can sustain that volunteer base. I think I got some good ideas from some folks today about how we might keep people interested. Um, but I've heard uh, sites having success with corporate groups, uh, groups that are looking for community service hours, retirees, um, and yeah, really, anyone that wants to be involved. So if any of you are in the Poughkeepsie area, it's probably, probably not too many of you, but if you want to help out, please reach out. I'd be um, happy to have you. Just Does anyone have any questions? Um, I don't have the percentage, but I have my eye on quite a few of them. Um, we've, we've used the Lower Hudson's um, priority list and cross-referenced that with the Arboretum list, and so we're starting to um, be able to work with the Arboretum um, to get them removed. So Sapphire Berry, they're removing like right now because it's on the list, and I can say it's on the list, and uh, this is a problem that we're we're looking out for. Um, I wouldn't say it's most of them, but there are certainly at least a handful of species that are still in the Arboretum, big mature specimens that I see potentially being problems. And I'm sure that happens here too with the Arboretum and the natural area joining. Um, are, you, are you seeing the Japanese maple spreading into your preserve? We haven't seen Japanese maple, um, but we have lots and lots of other species. So. It's a, it's a good question, um, and I think it was that, that kind of issue that kind of left us paralyzed for a while and not taking action um, when you're looking at something that's just collapsing and it's, you know, 100 acres of vines and you have two people. It, it, it kind of makes you feel like you can't accomplish anything, but when, I mean, for us, by going through this process and focusing on something that we really could do that made, made us be able to start taking action, I mean, um, the... Places that are pretty far gone for us, I, at this point we're thinking about it as a place we can study invasive species. Um, we don't have the capacity to manage there, but maybe we can learn something from it. Um, but I think it's, I mean, it's easier just in general to start working on something that you might be able to make progress on. Whereas if, if it seems hopeless, it's hard to, hard to start. Right. Yeah, I can't really see. Sure.
Um, so the domestic animal piece, um, we have done some, tra so we have feral cat issues and people dropping off feral cats because part of our property is a, is a working farm, so people think it's a great idea. Let's just take the, the cat there. Um, so we've done some trapping and neutering and rehoming. Some of them we can't trap, um, so that's a little bit tricky. Uh, we certainly get pushback about that. Um, people think that it should be their home, but just ecologically it's devastating and on a preserve, their impact on, on our, bird, our bird population and other small animals is really concerning. Um, what was the second part? Uh, So, so we are, so part of this conservation action planning process, when you identify those attributes, you have to figure out how you're gonna monitor them, and so that's how you can track change. So we're monitoring everything, amphibians, birds, um, plants, we have long-term vegetation plots, uh, pollinators, so it's a pretty extensive monitoring program. We don't have data yet, as because we've just started, but I feel like we're spending as much time monitoring as we are managing, so hopefully we will have that. Thank you. Okay, so uh, next up we have Bud Viverka from the Mayanis River Gorge Preserve who's gonna talk about conserving the old growth hemlock landscape up at the preserve. Hello everyone, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bud Viverka, and I am the Director of Land Management at the Mayans River Gorge. And uh, we're going to be talking today about saving our hemlocks within the Mayans River Gorge. Uh, just talk a little bit about our history of the preserve. Um, the preserve began in 1953. Uh, it was the first piece of property ever purchased by the Nature Conservancy. Uh, it was also the first national natural landmark in the United States. Um, and we are located in Westchester County. Um, we have about approximately 1,100 acres of protected land within the Minas River watershed that we specifically manage ourselves. Um, about 100 acres of that is conservation easement. Uh, but this area within this watershed is a drinking water source for 130,000 people. And so for us, preserving that watershed in as, as uh, natural state as possible is an important goal. Um, the preserve encompasses a large area of old growth hemlock forest, and some of those trees are over 400 years old. And uh, the lands are, as I mentioned, managed by the Miners River Gorge, which is an independent nonprofit organization. Um, a little bit more on our organization. Uh, we do uh, land protection. We do the stewardship, which is the stewardship staff is myself and a person two days a week and one volunteer occasionally. Um, and for 1,000 acres or so. And, uh, and then we have, additionally, we do research and education. Uh, so we have students come in. We have summer interns. Uh, we have uh, research graduate students, and we also have high school students who do research as well. And uh, we do a lot of research projects on the invasive plants we have out the gorge, the native plants, native wildlife, um, and work everywhere from uh, up northern into you know, within the region of the prism region all the way down in New York City with some of the coyote projects we put on. So as I mentioned, we have some very old growth hemlocks, and so for years, we looked at these hemlocks that were dying in the gorge and wanted to do something, but it was hard to get somebody to come and talk to us about what we were doing and trying to do anything with the hemlocks because we were kind of in the death zone for hemlocks. Um, but uh, a helpful thing that happened for us was the fact that the hemlock, well, the adelgid, which is a bad thing for most, actually ended up near Lake George, and that caused the state to go into a panic and formed the New York uh, Hemlock Initiative. And with that, um, uh, Cornell University is very involved. Uh, a gentleman there named Mark Whitmore uh, was interested in looking at uh, surviving trees within areas that had had uh, Hemlock Woolly Delta for a long time. And he came down and visited our property, and he felt that we could do something. Um, so just a little bit on our fight and with this Hemlock Woolly Delta. The Hemlock Woolly Delta is an aphid-like invasive forest pest. Um, came in in Virginia in 1951, as much as they know, and is now located from Maine to Georgia. Uh, it lives, feeds, reproduces exclusively on hemlock trees. Uh, the insect's present actually kills the buds, um, but being there, the tree kind of shuts things down. 
uh, kills the buds off the branches, which have the new growth, and eventually kills the tree in like four to 20 years. Some people shorten that up a little bit, but it can extend time. Um, there are some thoughts that maybe if the tree has scale, it's also weak enough not to kill itself. And so uh, it may sort of persist a little longer because it's so weak it can't even kill itself. Um, and so this is the state we are in. Um, at the base, of, you see here at the base of the needles on the new growth, this is where you'll find the hemlock woolly adelgid. If you looked out at the board out in the lobby too, talked about it, you'll see that there's a, these sesame seed-like little uh, cistins that are right at the base of each needle. And then as you get from November to May, you'll have this white uh, waxy wool that forms along the needles. So what we needed to do after we realized that somebody was willing to help and, and discuss and do some things is uh, we decided to work with the, as I mentioned, the New York State Hemlock Initiative, uh, Cornell University, and uh, Prism Partner Trillium Invasive Species Management. And over that process of three years, we marked DBH recorded basal bark treated with dinotephrin and metacloprid 2,340 hemlock trees within the Mayanus River Gorge. Uh, we also plant an additional 500 hemlock seedlings and are propagating seed at, currently propagating seed at the New York State Nursery um, to replant additional seedlings. Um, in addition to that, um, we also introduced a small population with the work of Cornell Lab, um, small population of Laracobius nigrinus beetles, which are a biocontrol. And so we're hoping that the combination of a biocontrol and the um, pesticide treatment will uh, allow these trees to come back a little bit, produce some seed, and start to create another generation. Additionally, um, we are monitoring, uh, so additionally, we are monitoring uh, what we're working on. Uh, so right now we're monitoring with digital imagery analysis. So taking these images like this, uh, taking all that white space, and then year after year, is there less white space in the computer model? Um, also, we are looking for uh, HWA reestablishment, uh, and that reestablishment is um, can occur after five years or so. But it's, we start at year three to start monitoring trees. After the um, pesticide treatment, it can come back, and so we want to see when these trees do get uh, reestablished with hemlock woolly adelgid. And so we use this Velcro ball method uh, that was developed by uh, Limbo et al. 2018. Uh, we take a racquetball, you cut it open, you fill it full of wood beads you get from the craft store, you seal it back up, and you put Velcro on it. Then we bought a six-foot slingshot, you attach it to the slingshot, and you launch it up into the top of the tree, and then you get interns to chase the balls throughout the woods. <laughs> um, we started with seven balls. There are three balls that have become the heart of the gorge. Um, so we did be able to bring back. I'm hoping that over time, as we go back out the sites, they'll reappear. Um, one hit the river, and I'm, the kids are chasing it down the river. And it, it, it's, it's probably something there in Long Island Sound now. I'm sorry about that. Um, but then also, additionally, um, we are working on additional research um, on hemlock willy adelgid phenology. I had some sheets on the table out there about the phenology of them and really understanding uh, when they appear. A big part of that phenology is to determine when to put the biocontrols on the landscape. Uh, and a, in addition to that, the scout little guy here is a leucopus fly. Um, and we're working with uh, Cornell Lab as well to uh, see when these guys will actually come out. Uh, so we've got a little box full of their little um, pupas and seeing when they emerge. And then every time I, one emerges, I collect it and we date it and we are gonna determine how these guys overwinter using different conditions and just see when it's best to put these guys out there as well on the landscape. Um, and then uh, we're doing some seed viability work and working with uh, a couple of students from Cornell Lab on that. Uh, so that's basically what we're doing. And then, uh, so our call to action for this is really to have um, anybody who has uh, hemlock trees, uh, especially five acres or more of them, that may be a partner in the prism or maybe not connected quite to the prism, but you have them out there. Um, we really want to know that you have them. Um, I'm working with Cornell. I am the Lower Hudson uh, 
kind of representative to the uh, Hemlock Managers uh, Association part of the uh, New York State uh, Hemlock Initiative. So I go to a meeting every year, the manager's meeting, and take any information that we have about what's happening in the Lower Hudson with hemlocks and who's treating and who has hemlock really adelgid and what state it's in because again, not only can you treat these, but if you have it, there is the potential to be a research site as well for some of this biocontrol work. Um, and so if you have hemlocks, if you're interested in being a part of that, um, please send me an email at bud at myanis.org. Um, and then of course, as I mentioned, we always have like one volunteer, sometimes. Um, I really, I really put him through his paces the other day. I'm hoping he comes back. Um, we were carrying locust logs up a trail to build trails and everything. Um, but then aside from just doing this, um, we are managing a large suite of invasive species. Uh, we do not only that, we do a lot of student research. So we are very, very busy. And so any time we can get a volunteer and we have five miles of trails to maintain. So uh, anytime we can get volunteers to come out, help us out, it's a wonderful thing. Um, and so you can, if you're interested in volunteering, please visit our website. There's a sheet to fill out there. If you don't feel like visiting the website, you can just email info at myanis.org to volunteer if you'd like to come out. And then lastly, uh, a lot of this work we do, especially in the um, treatments, um, herbicide work, uh, we, for large infestations, we'll bring in um, little uh, bobcats or uh, excavators and rip all that vegetation out of there to full restoration sites. At any point, we have two to three large restoration projects going within the thousand acres we've got. And so money to pay those folks to come out and do that, pay the invasive strike force to come or help uh, or have Trillium invasive species management come out, uh, takes a lot of money for an independent nonprofit. Uh, so donations, uh, you can again visit our website to help to donate uh, to the Myers River Gorge. So thank you, is there any questions? Is the woolly adelgid attacking trees other than hemlock? No, it's only found on, hemlock woolly adelgid can only survive on hemlocks. Um, what it, it, we actually, there's, they're all female because they, they use, um, where they're from originally, they use spruce as the part of the life cycle that produces males. So they don't have that in their life cycle here because we don't have the spruce within that context. So they all regenerate um, asexually. So the nice thing is, is, but they move tree to tree and group to group. So it's taken a little longer than if they were flyers, like the, the male is a flyer, and so then they can travel to greater distances, and we would already have it in the Adirondacks and places like that. Um, cold weather is another factor as well, and so that may be something that's helping to keep it from spreading too far. Um, but it is adapting, so we're finding that it's that we where we thought it couldn't be before. We're now finding it that it's adapting and can survive in these colder temperatures. Um, so you know, it, there's a lot of research going on. Cornell's doing a ton of the work, um, and there's a lot of unanswered questions still. I mean, we're still working on the just the general phenology of this species. Uh, we're, we pretty much know, but you're always looking at every little area because there can be slight changes if it's you know. If they're studying at Syracuse in that part of the state or we're studying it in the lower Hudson, there is changes and differences in the phenology of the species. But it is only found on hemlock, yes. Have you found that um, a topical application of the parental oil can help? Uh, yes, it, it can help. Um, again, it's something that needs to be done annually, though, as when we use this method, we, can, we got a little period of a break here of, of generally five years. Uh, you know, so it's a one-time treatment. It is a base, basal bark treatment that you do. Uh, so you're not having to do really spray the whole tree like some of these things do. Um, I know some of the companies are, I mean, they're getting ladder things and spraying the entire tree and, or soil drenches. And there's, there's, all, there's many different methods. Um, we utilize the methods that were given to us by Cornell. And then working with Tom at uh, Trillium to make sure that we were doing things as standard as possible with other partners that were within that management group. Anyone else? Hey, right, thank you.
Okay, our last speaker for today is definitely last but not least. It's Dr. Linda Rolator, who is the Director of Land Stewardship at the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference. And most importantly to our group today, she is our coordinator. She keeps us all going and started this PRISM and is a real force that keeps us all going and motivated and organized. And she is going to talk about a citizen science uh, program that she's created for the region for the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference. So welcome, Linda. All right, thanks, everybody. Um, so I'm going to tell you about the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference's Invasive Strike Force. And the Invasive Strike Force uh, was started uh, because uh, the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference uh, manages hiking trails. And we wanted to get more into science and more into care of the lands through which the trails run. And the big question was, well, you know, we manage trails from the Catskills all the way down to the Delaware Water Gap. Uh, how do we even know what invasives are out there? We have no clue. And if you looked at the public databases at the time in 2011, there were just a couple of scattered uh, points out there. Uh, so we said, well, you know, the solution to that is what we asked the hikers to go out and identify where those invasive plants are. And there was some debate at the time as whether hikers could even do that, you know, whether they knew enough, uh, whether you didn't have to have some expert uh, to do this. And so Rutgers put together uh, a study, 2006-2009, uh, uh, funded by the USDA, and they actually studied whether you could teach hikers to do this. And, um, <laughs> and whether you, you got results that were comparable to results from botanist. Um, and yeah, actually, uh, the hikers were about 80 to 90% uh, similar results as to what the, the botanists were finding. Uh, so uh, it, it turned out to be a, a valid way to do this. So we now have multiple levels of the program. Uh, the first level is the EcoQuest. This is uh, modeled after the EcoFlora project here at the New York Botanical Garden uh, that deals with uh, flora in the city. You have a focus species or maybe two every month, and you go out and map those. Uh, and the EcoQuest that we're running is uh, broader than the city. It covers the whole uh, lower Hudson region and northern New Jersey. Uh, so if you're not in the city and you want to participate in something like the EcoFlora project, uh, we have the EcoQuest project. Uh, it uses iNaturalist, and uh, when we uh, we do try to sync up the species sometimes, but uh, this, this month we're doing hemlock woolly adelgid and hemlocks, uh, so different from what uh, the EcoFlora project is doing. Uh, our basic surveyors are called the standard uh, surveyors. This is where you start as a, a brand new surveyor. Uh, we have 14 common invasive species that you're taught and you go out and search along your assigned trail. And I just want to real quick, how many people in the audience have done this for us? Great, look at that, look around, isn't that great? Um, and we've had, I, I was trying to do some real quick uh, math uh, before I, I did this presentation, over 500 surveyors uh, participating uh, since we started the program, uh, so I think that's great. I'll show you some of the data. Um, so what we do is we have uh, a day-long training session. Uh, it's an indoor training session with PowerPoints, plant samples, live uh, plants, and then we go outside and we do outdoor practice. Uh, and then uh, if you get good at your standard level, you can move up to the intermediate level and you can learn 11 less common invasives or maybe uh, in, that are a little bit harder. They may be common, but they're a little bit harder to identify. And you search along your assigned trail. So I forgot to mention that uh, the standard level, you get assigned to about a two mile section of hiking trail somewhere in the region and you can choose what park or area you wanna to go to. And the intermediate level also is along an assigned trail. Um, the more advanced level we call Blockbuster, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute, uh, but that covers 27 invasive species, some of which are in the standard level, some of which are in the intermediate level. And uh, you complete three surveys in a region, uh, which is a three mile by three mile block. 
uh, you do three uh, surveys. You do one in a natural area, one at the trailhead or edge of that natural area, and one in an impacted area. And that allows us to answer some research questions about what invasives are first coming into the area, what invasives are first contacting the natural area, and what invasives are able to penetrate that natural area or already have penetrated the natural area. Um, so this is what the Lower Hudson Prism Range is. Uh, we've mentioned before, uh, it starts, uh, we include Manhattan and the Bronx, and then it goes up, includes Westchester, Putnam, and Dutchess, Rockland County, Orange County, and the lower half of Ulster. And that northwest boundary is Route 209 that uh, separates us from the Catskills prism. Uh, so that's what I'm, we're talking about when we're talking about the prism region. And a lot of the programs that we do are focused in that region, but because I work for the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference, a lot of our programs also happen in New Jersey as well. Um, so when we uh, first looked at what we had obtained for the observations in this area, all those black dots are invasive species observations in this region. And, um, you know, some of those dots represent multiple invasive species observations, but some of them only represent one species. And uh, so we, and this is a conglomeration of records from IMAP Invasives database, the EDMAPS database, and also from our Invasive Strike Force surveyors. When you zoom in a little bit, like on Dutchess County here, you see there's large blank areas. Well, does that mean there's no invasives in those areas, or does it mean nobody surveyed those areas? So we had a problem here. We didn't know. And in order to be able to know, you have to know that it's been surveyed. So what we did is we created a grid across the whole region. Um, and this is where our Blockbuster program was born. Uh, so these grid squares, those of you have heard of the New York Metropolitan Flora Project uh, that was run out of Book Brooklyn Botanical Garden, these are the same squares. If you've heard of the Breeding Black, uh, Bird Atlas, uh, these are the same squares. So we're doing stuff that can be used, can be uh, run against other data that's already collected. Uh, so now what we can do is we can assign a volunteer to a square and they can do their surveys, and then we know that a survey has been done in that area. Uh, so the goal is to cover all of these squares. And um, what we've got, this is, our, this is now our hot off the press, uh, it, for, as of yesterday, with about half of the 2019 data loaded. Uh, these are where our observations are. And you can see the, the blank areas in Dutchess County have started to fill in a little bit from those blockbuster surveys, but you can also see that we still have a lot of blank areas in Orange County. So we really need people to survey in those blank areas in Orange County. And um, here's some other things that we can get from that data that we've gotten now from our, our invasive strike force surveys of nine years of surveying. Uh, we can get species distributions. So this is Tree of Heaven. On the, on the left is just the uh, point observations, but on the right are based on abundance levels that our surveyors collect. So the green is there's just a few, uh, yellow is there's some, orange is there's many, and red is extensive. And you'll see that most of the Tree of Heaven observations, there's just a few or some at that point. Um, it, but it's widespread throughout the region. The other thing we can get from this our species extents. On the left is Japanese angelica tree. And I've sort of drawn the purple line there around where the major infestation area is of that. What this allows us to do now is we can say, suppose we now find Japanese angelica tree outside of this region. That tells us that's an area we want to go take care of because it's expanding its range. The same here with black swallowwort. You can see black swallowwort's actually one of the species that's moving from the north to the south, and it's not so much uh, in New Jersey. So we actually now try to go to those locations and treat those locations that are outside of those ranges. And this is primarily from the data from our volunteers. The other thing we can do, these are again uh, surveys along hiking trails. Scunamunk Mountain is in Orange County. Uh, that's on the left. Blue represents no invasives. Um, so 
immediately that tells you something about this park, right? It tells you that it's not very invaded. There are some areas, and we can look at those areas and see, hey, they're pretty much near the trailheads. And that line through the middle is along a stream corridor, and that's all Japanese stilt grass. Um, we look over here at Sterling Forest, we can see something about that park now, too, uh, that it's pretty invaded. Um, and, but there's still areas, there's still sections that do, do not have very many invasives. And again, that's all from our volunteer surveys. Uh, so the other thing we use that data for is to target management action. I mentioned uh, spots that are showing up outside the range, but also along trails. So this is a section of the Appalachian Trail and the Delaware Water Gap. Um, the, the, across the northwest corner there is the Delaware River. And down the first red spot is at the parking. And as you start to come up the hill, uh, you've got invasives, but as you get about halfway up the hill, it turns to no invasives. And when you reach a ridge line, uh, it's pretty clean, except for these couple of areas. And it turns out that that's just garlic mustard. And so we went there, and we had a work day. You see the before and the afters. And um, actually schedule a work day there the following year to go and, and clean up. And, um, you know, when I went to scout, it was, I, I had a little grocery bag with me and I pulled what was left. There was not anything there, and we moved the work day. We actually got to this spot right at the right time. Um, you know, that result isn't typical for those of you that deal with invasives. You know it usually takes multiple years. Um, but this is the kind, you know, the, the ideal situation that we want to deal with. And um, this one, uh, this is a pile of Japanese barberry that we, we removed from the top of uh, Bear Mountain uh, on Perkins Tower. Um, normally, we wouldn't focus on barberry in situations like that. It's one of the widespread invasives, and uh, you know it, it's all along that park, and there's big areas of it. But uh, we, we felt like that uh, was a very high visibility spot and uh, that we could make a difference there, and in fact, we did. I don't, you know, if you can see me standing behind the pile there, it's, it's quite large. This was multiple dump trucks full uh, that the parks came and take, took away. We had a whole volunteer work day just to load the dump truck with <laughs> Okay, um, so how you can get involved, uh, you can join our ISF crew uh, as well. So we have volunteer work days throughout the region. We move them around. Uh, we try to have one in New Jersey, one east of Hudson, one of west of Hudson every month. Um, you get to see a different park and work on different species. Uh, so you can sign up for our crew mailing list and you get notice of when the work days are. Um, and you can also sign up uh, to receive our monthly newsletter. Uh, or uh, the monthly newsletter talks about all of our volunteer opportunities. Uh, the, invasive strike force surveying opportunities, the work days, as well as uh, we do rare and endangered plant monitoring, and uh, we have a native habitat that we uh, oversee as well. Uh, and you can email us at invasives at nynjtc.org. Um, so that's it. Okay, any questions? Right here. Right, the blockbuster surveys are not necessarily along trails. Uh, you have to find a natural area within that block as natural as possible. It could just be um, an abandoned lot or uh, abandoned agricultural field. And you also have to find um, highly impacted area, which could be along a, a roadside or a trail, uh, um, sorry, utility corridor or something like that. So we give you three different places that you have to look for and find and do a survey in. Okay, back here. Right.
Yeah, uh, we are. It's in part of our region. However, we usually don't because the New York City Parks covers it. Um, and they are, have a little bit more financing than we do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but you're the one that asked the uh, question about prioritization and whether we would deal with that uh, extensive porcelain barrier. And, and we actually wouldn't. Um, you know, I, I've been uh, talking to a lot of people about this. And what we do, you know, we're dealing with invasive species. You have to back up and say, why are we dealing with invasive species? We're dealing with invasive species to protect something, to preserve something. And so those are the areas that we choose to work in first. And if we had more resources, if we had more money, more people, we could t deal with those highly invaded monoculture areas. But right now, we are focusing on the areas we're trying to protect first. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and lady next to you. Porcelain berry. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think can be done to save those trees? I uh, Bob, Bob, are you here? <laughs> Bob's, Bob's working on it. Um, you know, again, this is another one of those cases with not enough resources to do what really needs to be done. And those are highly invaded areas. You need a you basically need a brush hog to come through and cut everything. And then you either need to excavate the roots or you need to, you know, spot treat with herbicide. And that would actually take care of it, but it's an a expensive process. And then after that, because it is completely covering everything and there's probably a seed bank of invasives, you would have to follow up regularly and plant probably. So the money that goes into that is, is you know, <laughs> prohibitive for a lot of us. So. They would be interested if their voters told them they needed to be interested in it. Right? Okay. Um, any right down here. Uh, yeah, that, that's definitely a method, and uh, when we're dealing with areas that uh, we don't have time to completely remove, uh, cutting down the large fruit-bearing uh, individuals is the first thing to do, and then start working on removing the smaller ones. Uh, you know, that way you're preventing spread until you can get to actually removing. Uh, so that's definitely a method, and we, we definitely use that, not necessarily on barberry, because we don't deal with barberry a lot anymore. We're, we're dealing with things like sapphire berry and Japanese angelica tree and, you know, the early invaders. Um, with regards to the berberus, uh, we were removing those from the top of Perkins Tower, uh, I mean, uh, Bear Mountain, where it's very, very rocky, and you actually can't dig them out. So we were cutting them and doing spot treatments on this on this stumps. Uh, it's impossible to dig the roots out from between rocks there. Uh, so that's why most of them look cut. Uh, but whenever we're doing that, we do pull anything that's small enough to pull. So. 
Yeah, so when you use the iNaturalist app and you take a picture and you share it, um, that gets uploaded to iNaturalist, and we see that, and we would take those records in uh, for uh, the Lower Hudson Prism or, or using it for um, our, our monitoring and management efforts. Uh, so we, I do, I watch that, and uh, there are times where, um, you know, we'll see something come in, like we saw Beautyberry come in, and we looked at that and uh, you know, gone and identify yeah, this is a Japanese one, and, we, and we've jumped on that and, and things like that. So uh, just by using iNaturalist and posting your, your pictures, we will see those. So that's contributing. Yes, yeah, yeah. And New York City Parks is also a PRISM partner. Uh, so the data is always useful uh, going into, uh, at a minimum, iNaturalist, our, but our database of record is uh, IMAP Invasives. So if you can get it in there. And especially if you can include abundance information, uh, there's a lot of records that say, you know, it's here. But well, does that mean one species, one individual, or does it mean a whole big patch? So if you can include abundance information, even if you have to put it in the comments, that's really, really helpful. Um, anyone else here? Down here, yeah, time. Right. Well, you know, as you know, we, we work a lot on hiking trails, and um, we are hiking out into what you know, a half a mile, a mile, and doing a removal. We don't carry that stuff back with us. Um, so these are these are my guidelines for how to deal with that. First, try to do your removals when there's no seed. Okay. So know when the plant goes to seed, and try to do the removals before that, so you're not having to deal with seeds. Second, um, when you pull the plant out, you shake the soil off of it, off the roots, so they're exposed to the air. If, it's, if you're just dealing with a few, you can just sort of hang them on other branches or um, leave them laying on a log or something like that to dry out. I always tell my volunteers, you know, hang it on the branch as a warning to other invasives, you know. <laughs> um, but, but when you have a a lot, you can't, of course, do that. You know, it would be, uh, it would be like a Christmas tree, all, all the invasives hanging everywhere. Um, so what we try to do is we try to find a, a large flat rock to pile everything on within the infestation. Um, so we, we concentrate uh, a pile uh, and we try to put it on a surface, either a flat rock or maybe up on a couple, uh, some branches or logs so that it's off of the ground and it can't root in. And then we go back, because we're never going to a spot just once. We're going back the next year and the next year to make sure that it's all gone. So when we go back and check, we know we can con look at that one concentrated pile and see if there's anything germinating there. So if you're removing when there's no seeds, uh, most times you can just simply dry the plants out. As long as they're dried out, they can be composted. They're not going to root in. They're not going to, you know, regenerate. Um, and so that's ideal is to do it when there's no seeds. 
Uh, if you have the time and patience to pick all the seeds off, you can do that uh, and bag, you know, just bag and throw the seeds away. Uh, sometimes that's practical and sometimes it's not. Um, but if, it's, if, if you're restricted to it, try to find a, a place you can just concentrate everything together in a pile. If it's in your own yard, the back corner, you know, no one goes into that back corner under the tree. Maybe you can use that as your area to pile everything. And then do go check, make sure that nothing is regenerating there. Um, but once it's all dried out, uh, without seed, once it's all dried out, you can compost. Okay. Right. Anything else? Okay. I think we need to wrap up. So. Thank you everyone for sticking it out the entire day and we look forward to seeing you out there taking action and as always NYBG, the Lower Hudson Prism, all the partners who spoke today and who didn't speak are here as resources. So please reach out, we, that's what we're here for. And have a great weekend and hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.